Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. We are Initiative for Inclusive Design, and our goal is to create an ongoing conversation around inclusive spaces, which has gotten us heavily involved with disability rights and activism this past semester. However, we are interested in all areas of discrimination that a space can control, which has opened many doors for this group on campus. Some of the things we are involved with are evaluating the campus for accessibility, where it's lacking and where it's done well. We help local businesses create architectural drawings that go beyond ADA code, which you'll learn about in a minute if you aren't familiar with the term. We have worked with the Michigan Daily Newspaper and have spent hours with them in their writing rooms talking about the issues here in Ann Arbor, as well as around the world. We've met with a broad range of university committees to help make dorms and classrooms more accessible. And we are currently competing in a UMich campus-wide competition called Campus of the Future and are currently recruiting new members. So if you're interested, there will be a sign-up sheet by the door where you can leave us your contact info or you can find one of us and talk at the end of the lecture. We also hold Lunch and Learns to share what we've researched, and today we hope that you'll leave with a better understanding of how spatial qualities affect a diverse group of people. Today we will be hearing from disability rights activist Celeste Adams, a freshman in Stamp School of Art and Design, and Mieko Preston, a third year grad student in Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning. They will be giving a talk about disability history and culture, along with some current facts around the subject, and then we will leave some time for questions and conversation at the end. Also, this next Thursday, March 30th, IID will be having a more conversational event where we will present research that the group has done on campus, as well as have further conversation with anyone who's interested in the topics of disability and design. We will send another email for that, so please RSVP if you are interested. Thank you and enjoy. Okay, thank you, Rachel, for the introduction. That was really great. Um, so basically, how we're going to do this is we're going to run through a bit of the history. Um, Mieko and I are kind of going to go back and forth. We both have slides throughout the whole thing that we're going to talk about. Um, and then we're going to get into some more contemporary issues. Um, and then we're going to get into the whole design aspect. So are you ready? <laughs> so we're going to start with Plato and Aristotle, who are... Uh, most well known as being famous Greek philosophers who essentially uh, taught uh, some of the most important things and some of the most valued things that we know in Western culture today. But what's not very well known about them is that they essentially uh, enforced what is called eugenics and are quoted with saying, uh, let there be a law that no deformed child shall live. That's Aristotle. And then Plato said the offspring of the inferior or or the better when they chance to be deformed shall be put away. So this essentially set the stage for how people with disabilities were to be treated. Um, so uh, there was actually a law because of their teachings that was put in place. And if at birth uh, it was noticed that a child was disabled, they would be immediately killed. Um, and uh, throughout, mainly in the uh, 20th century, but even still today, people are actually discovering mass graves uh, of bodies of uh, disabled children that were killed because of the teachings of Aristotle and Plato. And that's all throughout Europe. Uh, so then we get uh, Jesus, who comes into religion as, as sort of like a really prominent, really important figure throughout multiple different types of religions. And in terms of disability, one thing that we sort of, uh, that sort of comes up most commonly is that uh, he was seen as someone who could perform miracles and could essentially cure sick and disabled people. And uh, during this time period, uh, a little bit, you know, after Aristotle and Plato, the, the law of immediately killing uh, disabled children was, uh, it, it wasn't as popular, so we were still allowed to live in some cases, but what would happen is um, that instead of being able to live within the city, within public spaces, we would be exiled into, into the country, into essentially farmland, where we would form our own colonies. And there's a, it's a really good uh, sort of example of this in this painting. So you see in the background the sort of main city, but then you see this colony of uh, disabled people, and then Jesus is, is sort of coming to them as the savior figure who's going to cure them essentially of their identities. 
Then we get uh, the Salem Witch Trials, which uh, not only spread throughout the United States, but were also very prominent in Europe. And again, one thing that a lot of people don't know about the witch trials was that the main groups of people who were targeted for this were disabled women. And the reason for this is, is that there, especially if it was a physical disability that you could see um, and that was noticeable, uh, it would, that would come off as being something that's very negative, that's considered impure. And if it's negative and if it's impure, how can you be essentially like a child of God? You can't. So therefore, you're in cahoots with the devil. You are a product of the devil. And that resulted in um, the deaths and murders and burnings of thousands of disabled women. Uh, but then also, if you were a mother and you were not disabled and you gave birth to a child who, who was disabled, you were also targeted for this. Because that was, how could you, uh, how could you be pure? if your body could then produce something that is so impure. Um, here we begin to introduce uh, the intersectionality of marginalized communities. Um, intersectionality is uh, systemic oppressions overlapping. Each marginalized community is kept from civilization standard, whether it be due to economics, politics, or social aspects. Uh, the more layers of intersectionality, the more complex the opportunity for a stable quality of life and the wider the divide is from inclusion and accessibility to assistance and acceptance. The most common socioeconomic assumption of black disability is homelessness, impoverishment, uh, drug dependence, alcoholism, or any condition resulting from, a presumed, from presumed poor choices. In her essay on black feminism, Caitlin Stewart suggests disabled black women are next to invisible in the discourse of disability studies, saying disability studies often forces women of color to deny their disability or deny their ethnicity if they wish to be a part of the disabled community. Uh, here we see a uh, Sojourner Truth, um, abolitionist and women rights activist. Although well known for her outspoken support of human rights for the black community and women, she did underemphasize her disability of a deformity in her right hand due to an improperly healed injury, often in photographs as seen um, when she's sitting here with Lincoln. Um, her, excuse me, her hand is um, usually hidden from view or as seen on the right, it sits benignly in her lap. Thus, the practicality behind her famously strong arm was actually just compensation strength. Um, with Harriet Tubman, um, she's also a renowned abolitionist, an army spy during the Civil War. Um, she actually received a head injury at a young age, and she, throughout her life, she regularly experienced dizziness and seizures. Like Truth, the facts of her disability were downplayed as she focused on redefining the role of a strong black female. Stuart wisely asks, if black women are supposed to be superhumanly strong, what about women who cannot perform up to that standard or just need help or simply have a disability? So then we get uh, into sort of the mid 1800s, early 1900s with circuses and human freak shows. And essentially what would happen was if you were disabled um, at this point in time, you had a couple options with how you would live your life. You would either be, uh, from usually from a very young age, locked away in your family's home, either in um, basements or attics or somewhere that was very hidden. You would uh, not be allowed to go out into public. You would not be allowed to go to school, get a job, anything like that. Um, and essentially no one outside of your family would really know about you. Because if, if you were uh, made public in any way, that would bring shame onto your family. That would bring shame onto your parents. Um, and, but then if you, if you weren't hidden away by your family, uh, you could also be institutionalized. So your family could essentially, for multiple reasons, whether it's because uh, they don't want to uh, have you because uh, you bring shame onto the family or because maybe they just can't afford certain medical treatments or what have you, uh, you would be institutionalized. Um, again, not receiving any form of education, not allowed to get a job, not allowed to go out into public. But if you, uh, if you were to usually escape those situations, um, 
your alternative to that, because again, you couldn't get a job, you couldn't essentially live on your own, you would join the circus or the human freak shows. Um, and this was a really good way for people with disabilities to actually make money. It's sort of the, one of the very first jobs that we were actually able to have. Um, but uh, what's, what's sort of bad about this is that it, um, it normalized the fact that we, uh, our disabilities are something that um, can be sort of entertaining, that uh, our, our history is not something that can be taken seriously, and we are only here for the entertainment of non-disabled people. So then we get into the 1930s, um, and around this time, going back to uh, sort of, I, t I mentioned earlier when I was talking about Ar uh, Aristotle and Plato, that they started to enforce something called eugenics. And uh, this really came into uh, popularity uh, in the early 1900s, or sorry, yeah, 1900s, but especially in the 1930s. And eugenics is essentially this idea that... Uh, if you are disabled, you should either be uh, sterilized, so you can't reproduce, or you should be murdered. Um, and essentially, if if you um, if our population of people cannot reproduce and we cannot continue to live, then therefore there will be this uh, sort of pure race of human beings. Um, and so here we have Dr. Alexis Carroll, who is actually a practicing doctor. Um, and he really brought eugenics into the forefront of a sort of popular conversation, especially um, within the United States. And there would actually be uh, all over the United States, especially, I mean, there were, this happened in Europe too, but there would actually be eugenics clubs that non-disabled people could join. It would, the clubs would be held in churches, at people's homes, um, you know, at, at country clubs, wherever. And... Uh, it would be a mix of anyone from housewives to uh, people in college to actually doctors. And doctors would present essentially um, scientific research that proves why we should practice eugenics, why disabled people should not be allowed to live or should not be allowed to reproduce. And Alexis Carroll was really central to this because in 1939 he publishes the book Man the Unknown. Um, and it, was, it essentially laid out his argument for eugenics. It enforced eugenics. But not only did it do that, of course, in uh, you know, the 1930s, we have uh, the upcoming rise of the Nazi regime. And Alexis Carroll was really interested in this. And in the introduction to his book, uh, he actually praises the Nazi regime for what they are doing in terms of enforcing eugenics. Um, and so then we get to uh, 1935, where uh, we, we have the Holocaust that's, that's starting. And what a lot of people don't know about the Holocaust is that disabled people were essentially used as guinea pigs to test run the Holocaust. And uh, so from 1935 up until uh, 1942, uh, it was commonly known that disabled people were uh, being gassed and being taken into concentration camps. And uh, in between that time period, up until 1930, or sorry, 1942, um, it's estimated that about 70,000 disabled people were killed. But the thing is, is in 1932, Hitler uh, sort of made this announcement that he wanted to end the program. And the program for these killings was actually called Operation T4, otherwise known as Mercy Killings, um, which enforced the idea that... Um, by committing these acts of eugenics, by committing these murders, not only are you relieving non-disabled people of the burden of the existence of disabled people, but you are actually relieving disabled people of their own of the burden of their own existence. Um, so he made this announcement in 1942 that he was going to end uh, end the operation of mercy killings, but uh, that was completely false, and he actually continued with these killings up until 1945 at the end of World War II. And it's estimated that in between just those three years, the total number of disabled people that were killed was actually uh, 275,000. Uh, so essentially 205,000 more people were killed just within those three years. 
And so here we have some of the mass graves for some of the disabled people who were killed. Um, the uh, 1950s murder of Emmett Till um, of the 14-year-old Chicagoan spurred the civil rights movement. Uh, what precipitated the death was the accusation that the African-American boy had inappropriately whistled suggestively at a white woman. In fact, Till had suffered a bout of polio as a child that left him with a pronounced stutter. His mother had taught him to whistle when he needed to relax his throat muscles to manage his speech impediment. While the story of the whistle is, greatly known, is generally known, the actual reason Till's disability is not broadly shared. So uh, now we're going to go back into uh, sort of the culture of asylums and institutions and state schools. So this is a recent photo, a relatively recent photo of an asylum. And I just want to ask everyone, besides the fact that everything is, because it, it is abandoned, so it's supposed to be kind of in disarray and decaying. But besides that, can anyone tell me what is wrong with this image? No one? Yeah? That's one thing, but that's not it. <laughs> nope, not it. So it's actually right in the center. There's a wheelchair there. And the main purpose for institutions, for asylums, for state schools, is to treat people who are neurodivergent, and if you don't, if you aren't familiar with that term, it's actually it's essentially more uh, it's a more accepted and appropriate term for uh, mental illness or mentally ill. Um, but so it sort of it sort of makes you wonder, like, why would you have medical equipment that suggests a physical disability in a place where you're treating people who are neurodivergent? And uh, the reason for this is essentially places like Willowbrook. So uh, Willowbrook was, uh, was constructed in, uh, and opened in 1947. And uh, throughout, this, throughout the 1940s especially, there were a lot of institutions, state schools, asylums that were, that were, uh, that were being uh, built and put into action. And they were essentially advertised as uh, almost like these retreats that if you had a disabled family member and you couldn't care for them or they couldn't care for themselves, you could send them here. And they would be treated, they would be cared for. Um, and essentially when they came out, they would be, uh, they would either have a really great treatment plan and they would be, you know, they would be able to perform well in public uh, just like everyone else or they would be completely cured. Um, but uh, they, what, the thing is, is that, um, there was this sort of stigma around disability that if you had a physical disability, it also meant that you were neurodivergent because uh, no one really considered the fact that with physical disabilities, um, you know, that's something that that's something that happens to your body. People thought that, for example, if you couldn't walk, you were you were really stupid. You weren't smart enough to know how to walk. And so places like Willowbrook essentially became these dumping grounds, these human warehouses, where if you had a disabled family member, no matter what type of disability it is, no matter if they need to be uh, treated or not, you could send them here and they would be taken care of, they would be dealt with, they would be treated. Um, and, uh, but a lot of the family members, like I said, they sort of had this, um, this idea that they were sending their family members to a really good place, that they were doing a good thing. But, oh, the clicker is not working. The computer. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, there we go. Thank you. But what they didn't know is that inside, this is actually the kind of stuff that was going on. This is very specific to Willowbrook. So um, Willowbrook was essentially designed to house 4,000 patients. But uh, what actually ended up happening is it became so overcrowded that they had almost 7,000 patients. Um, and that led to uh, 
there not being just enough room or enough resources resources to be able to house and treat and take care of all the patients who were there. Um, there was also a lot of really severe patient abuse. So here you have an image of a young child who's hogtied to their bed. And if you came into Willowbrook as an infant, you know, you were put in like a child's bed with like the, the bars, you know, on either side so the child doesn't roll out um, or fall out. But uh, when, when, Willow, when these things were sort of discovered, uh, they actually found children who were put in those beds as, as small, small babies who were now nine years old or 10 years old. And they had never left that bed. And because they were now older and, you know, they had grown up and their bodies had matured and they were essentially able to climb out of the beds, to keep them in the beds, they would literally tie them down to the beds. Um, If any patient acted out, they were punished by, uh, in a multiple of ways, they could be beaten, they could be, there's actually a story of a man um, who, uh, who acted out and they locked him away in a closet, in a completely dark closet. And he did not leave that closet for 27 years. And by the time he was let out, he, he had been in there for so long that his eyes had completely adjusted to the darkness and he had gone completely blind. Um, so then in 19, uh, 1969, Robert Kennedy visited Willowbrook because some people had started to hear hear that there were some not very good things that were happening at the institution. And so he essentially came there and just barged in and walked around. And uh, he essentially, when he came out, he talked to a news crew and uh, essentially told them that what he saw was a human warehouse, that it was a snake pit, that he um, the conditions that he saw were worse than conditions that, you know, animals undergo when they're put into a zoo. Um, but unfortunately with that, uh, he, like, that, that happened, but then no one really followed up on it. Nothing, nothing happened with it. There was no follow-up. There was no documentation. But then we get 1972, and Geraldo Rivera sort of picked up on that Robert Kennedy story. And... Uh, he decided to get a camera crew, a whole news crew, and essentially, again, barge into Willowbrook and this time document everything that's going on. So when they leave, they have proof. And this is the kind of stuff that they came out with. Um, People not even in rooms. There was like feces and urine just all over the floor. The place had not been taken care of. There was actually, if you see in this image, you'll notice that there's sort of a light that's, that's there. That is the light that is coming from the camera because this area of Willowbrook did not have any power. Um, the conditions were terrible. Patients were not being treated. Um, a lot of patients uh, were really malnourished and had actually been starved, not just because uh, they, Willowbrook actually couldn't afford to feed their patients, but also because that was another form of punishment. Um, again, these are more children who are hogtied to their beds, that one actually by her neck. Um, and he actually noted that there were some people who were in there who he actually thought had passed away, who were, and they, he thought that they were corpses, but they were actually still alive. They were just so sick and so weak because of the conditions that they, they really looked like they were dead. Um, so then we get, uh, after that, um, the school, you know, he, he publishes that and he publishes his findings and um, the, instead of actually closing down the school, they just reformed it. Um, but, it but this footage led people to wonder, okay, if that's going on in, in Willowbrook, what's happening at all of our other institutions, all of our other state schools? Um, and uh, more sort of things like this were, were going on where people would just go into other institutions and with cameras and document what was going on. That led to either a bunch of these, these uh, institutions being completely closed down or getting more reforms. Um, but specifically for Willowbrook, the reforms that, you know, that they did, just, they just weren't enough. And so in 1982, the school closes down. Um, then we get uh, the Vietnam War. And because of 
uh, advances in medical technology, medicine, treatment plans, everything like that, a lot of the soldiers who, uh, who were able to come home actually had some way of, you know, instead of just being confined again to their beds and not being able to get up and move around or go back to their work, they could, they could be treated. Um, but I think, do you want to say? I do. I actually wanted to say um, off of that, um, a lot of the soldiers that went to Vietnam were minority soldiers. And when they came home, um, they, since they were more likely to serve uh, in ground units and experience combat, um, they, were, they were likely to suffer higher rates of post-traumatic stress disorder and other mental health problems um, than white soldiers. Um, however, the black and Latino Vietnam vets were not treated equally by the VA upon their return and um, were more prone to disabilities than, that could have been treated. Um, it's further studied that blacks were more likely to have been exposed to Agent Orange defoliants in, um, in Vietnam and were more susceptible to ailments linked to dioxin, including heart disease and cancer. Um, and VA officials have publicly acknowledged that minorities and female veterans often were treated as second-class citizens despite wounds, illnesses, and injuries as serious or more grievous than those received by white GIs. But yeah, so you, you have all these people who are coming back who um, are now, you know, they get back and they want to return to their homes. They want to be able to go back to work. Um, and when they get back, they realize, oh, wait, there are a bunch of stairs to get into my house. I, I can't actually get into my home or uh, I can't take the bus to go to work because there are stairs that you have to take to get onto the bus. Or you know, once I once I get to work, I can't you know I can't actually do this. There are just so many uh, barriers in terms of the way that public spaces were designed that people found that they couldn't live the lives that they were living before they went off to war. So that spurred a bunch of protests um, throughout the 70s, um, where uh, it wasn't only veterans who were protesting from from the Vietnam War. But uh, other people with all different types of disabilities got involved. So here you have, uh, hell no, we won't go into any nursing home. That was essentially uh, saying that you know, the government needs to start providing people with disabilities resources so we don't have to be in places like you know, reformed Willowbrook. We can actually live on our own, we can have our own lives, and we can operate you know, just like anyone else in the world. Um, and then, did you want to speak about this slide? No? Okay. Um, uh, but yeah, so more protests went on. Uh, the sign that says, I can't even get to the back of the bus. Um, we will ride. Um, and then you get this image here. And there's a lady who is in a white t-shirt, sort of, uh, I think, to your left. Yeah. Um, and her name's Judy Human. And during this time, she was one of the sort of forefront activists who really pushed this whole thing. And her story is that when I think she was 12 years old, um, she contracted polio and she had to start using a wheelchair. And, uh, you know, after, after she got her chair, she wanted to go back to school. And when she tried going back to school, her teachers told her, we can't have you because your wheelchair is a fire hazard. This is actually something that I've been told before, so it's interesting see it, seeing it in this context. But uh, so, so yeah, you, you can't go to school. Um, and her, she and her mother were completely outraged by that. So they fought with the school to get her in school, and she eventually did uh, go back to school, and she was able to graduate. Um, and then after, after she finished school, she wanted to become a teacher in New York. And when she applied for her job, she was told by the New York public schools the same exact thing. You can't teach because your wheelchair is a fire hazard. If there's a fire, how can we expect you to get out of the building, let alone get your students out of the building? Um, and that led her to file a huge lawsuit that actually ended up going to the Supreme Court. And she won, and she became the first uh, disabled teacher in the state of New York. And then uh, that's Judy in the middle, and then next to her, um, on her left is Ed Roberts, who uh, he also had polio, and he was the first student to the, the, uh, the first disabled student to graduate from Berkeley. And uh, when he slept at night, he had to sleep inside of an iron lung. And there were a whole 
Uh, there were many issues in terms of him actually getting accepted into the school, but once he finally did, um, he said, uh, okay, well, I want to I wanna live in the dorms. And they said, oh, well, we, we can't do that because we don't want other students to see that you sleep in an iron lung because that's going to that's gonna really freak everyone out. That's not okay. We don't, we don't think that's appropriate. And so he said, well, you know, what do I do? What do I do about that? I have to have somewhere to live. And they suggested that he go live in a hospital, in the hospital that's close to the Berkeley campus. And there was a lot of arguing sort of back and forth about that. And um, the school wouldn't really budge on it. So what they came to was uh, that he would live in a hospital, but he had to be treated. He, he couldn't be treated like a patient. He had to be treated like a student. That this area of the hospital, he wasn't going to have like nurses or doctors coming in to check on him. He could be fully independent. Um, and then he ended up graduating, and uh, yeah, he he did a ton of really amazing act, activism work throughout the '70s with with Judy Human. Um, and then, uh, largely because of those protests. Uh, in the uh, ni- in 1990, you get the signing of the ADA Act. And the ADA Act essentially requires that, it, it's a whole sort of slew of things, but it requires that uh, all public and government buildings be made uh, fully accessible. <laughs> and uh, so that means stuff like uh, automatic doors with push buttons, um, uh, what else? Making sure that in bathrooms there are accessible stalls, things like that. Um, and it also uh, required stuff like, uh, you know, if you're an employer, you can't discriminate against someone who's applying for a job at your business because of their disability. Um, so it covered a lot of things, but what's what's difficult with it is that the majority of that of the ADA Act was actually created by non-disabled people. So that brings us to, go ahead. Um, That brings us to um, a quote by um, Nelson Mandela um, when he addressed um, the, I think it's the committee, the conference of uh, disabled, international disabled, um, the International Disabled Institute. Um, It is not a question of patronizing the philanthropy towards disabled people. They do not need the patronage of the non-disabled. It is not for them to adapt to the dominant and the dominating world of the so-called non-disabled. It is for us to adapt our understanding of a common humanity. So that sort of brings us to our next segment um, with segregated spaces. So while the ADA Act is really, really amazing, um, it's still the, the sort of disabled voice that was involved in it is, uh, it's barely there. So while it allowed us to now go out into public, it allowed us to you know, get jobs, to go to school, to not be discriminated against, that was created all under the guise of sort of a non-disabled opinion. So what we're left with is we can go out into public, but the majority of that experience is going to be a segregated experience. So that gives us stuff like uh, what is known as uh, handicap accessible parking spaces. I'm just gonna call them accessible spaces because handicap is actually a pretty derogatory term that we don't use, even though it's still um, on many of the signs that you see in these parking spaces. Um, But what's interesting is that usually when you go into a parking lot, you get about two or three of these spaces. All of the other spaces are, they're just regular parking spaces. And what I've always wondered is why is it that when I park, I have to have my own designated area? Why can't we just make it so every single parking space is accessible? And like, you know, why do I, why do I have to go into this one particular area? And another problem with this is that by only having two or three, three spaces per parking lot, uh, that sort of assumes that there aren't a lot of disabled people in the world who actually need those parking spots. Um, So one, it can actually be really hard to find a parking spot sometimes. And two, you also get people who aren't disabled who decide, oh, that's really convenient because these parking spaces are right at the front of the lot, so I'm going to take them and I'm going to park there. And whereas if every single space 
was accessible. Not only do, do you have a range of options, but you don't have to worry about you know circling around the parking lot waiting for one of those you know two or three spaces to open up. Um, and then you also get stuff like uh, in the disabled community we call these stramps, and it's essentially a ramp. There's a few variations of it, but this one is basically a ramp that is so steep that if you're in a chair, you can't really get up that on your own. You have to have help. Um, so this is another way that sort of, uh, you know, the, the ADA requirement is there, but it still doesn't really work. And another thing with the ADA is that there are so many public buildings and government buildings that uh, either do not fully live up to the ADA standards or they just completely ignore them. So for example, here um, on campus, if you go to Weiser Hall, there's an elevator there. That, uh, but it, when you go inside of it, it only takes you to the basement where all of the janitor's lockers are. So if you need to get to class, you have to go up. I, I, I was there because I, I had to go to class there a few weeks ago, and uh, I have never seen such a large flight of stairs in my entire life that is your only option to get to class. So I couldn't go to class that day. Um, but it's just stuff like that where, you know, people feel like they can sort of get around the ADA because they know that, one, probably no one's going to call them out for it, no one's going to try and sue. If they do, it's most likely going to be someone who's disabled. Um, and because of that, that court case probably won't be taken so seriously. And, uh, you know, it's your chances of winning aren't, aren't really that great, especially if, for example, you're disabled and you're going up against something like, you know, a really, really big institution like the University of Michigan or, you know, other really major institutions. Like, you just, you don't have a chance with that. Um, then we get other stuff like this where you have your sort of standard building, and you get this really, you know, grand, extravagant set of stairs that take you to the front of the building. And this is the main entrance, whereas if, you know, if you're someone who can't take the stairs, you have your own little labeled entrance that takes you all around, you know, to the back or to the side of the building to your own door. And this is actually, like, a really, really nice drawing. Like, usually when you go to the back of a building to get to the accessible entrance, Instead of having like really nice bushes and shrubs, you get like a giant dumpster or trash. And I feel like that kind of says a lot that, you know, uh, as a disabled person, if I want to get into a public building, I have to take the same route as the trash. Um, so it's just kind of like all of these little things, like, you know, we don't really think about them. But in terms of how that impacts how disabled people are viewed, by the public and how we're treated, it's actually huge. Because if I can't take the main entrance to the building, if I have to go around the side, my body, my disabled body, is completely hidden. How do, how do I engage in the public space? How do people know that I exist? And I feel like if you can't see the disabled body, if you can't engage with disabled people because we are so segregated, I don't understand how there can be a conversation so that we can work to sort of move forward and, you know, change things like segregation and get, you know, get more basic human rights for people with disabilities. There's also uh, signs like these that I'm sure a lot of you have seen before. In case of fire, do not use elevator, use stairs. Again, <laughs> what happens if you can't take the stairs? What do you do in a situation like that? Um, for me, usually what I've experienced in the past is that if I'm you know, not on the first floor and the, and the fire alarm goes off, um, I'm told that I have to wait. I have to wait there. If there's like an emergency call button, I press that. It directs me to, you know, whoever, the police, the fire department, whatever. I tell them who I am, where I am, what's going on, all that kind of stuff. And then I literally just wait. And I'm not allowed to have anyone, by law, I am not allowed to have anyone wait with me. I am completely alone. Now imagine if you can't take the stairs and you're, you're five years old or you're six years old and you can't have anyone wait with you. That's really, really scary. And then not only are you waiting, but I've waited times for up to an hour, even more. If there's a real fire and I'm waiting there for an hour, 
That's like, that's like a life or death situation for me. And uh, essentially what I'm waiting for is for someone from the fire department to come and get me. And what I've been told in the past is that when that happens, um, I have to be carried down the stairs, lifted out of my chair. Well, the problem with that is because of my disability, I have to have a customized wheelchair. To get a customized wheelchair, you usually have to wait anywhere between uh, four and six months. So what am I supposed to do? Just lay in bed for four or six months for like half a year? How do I go to school? If I have a job, how do I, you know, how do I go to work? How do I make a living? Your life is just completely put on hold because of stuff like that, because no one ever decided that it might be important to come up with something alternative compared to stairs. So now we've got some really good examples of accessible spaces. Um, so this is Gallaudet University. It was designed by LTL Architects. And Gallaudet is a university that uh, caters specifically to those who are deaf or hard of hearing. And um, so what you'll see in this image is uh, there's a ramp that you have. And not only is it a ramp, but it's a really wide ramp. So if you're, next to, if you're talking with someone and you're signing, um, if you're in a really narrow space, uh, someone, you know, the person who you're signing with or the people that you're signing with might have to go behind you. So instantly that communication is completely cut off. Whereas if you have a wide ramp, you can be walking or going down the ramp and you can still be signing and carrying on that conversation. Um, it's also important that it's a ramp because if you're going down a flight of stairs, you usually have to be looking at where you're putting your feet and being careful of your movement. Um, which, if you're again, if you're signing, that that sort of uh, visual connection between you you looking at the person next to you who's signing is cut off because you're looking at where you're putting your feet. Um, you'll also see that there's a lot of natural light, um, so that makes it easier on the eyes. That also uh, is natural light is really good against skin tone, so it makes uh, it makes signing it's easier for the for the hands to stand out. Um, and it's not, you know, compared to neon lights that are actually really exhausting on the eyes. Natural light is just a lot better. Um, the entire color palette of the university works well, again, with any skin tone. So if you're signing, um, and for example, if you're a professor and you're signing to a group of students, everyone in that entire group can still see you really well without having any colors, um, you know, distract or uh, not be in good contrast with your skin tone. Um, also, the majority of the furniture is, uh, isn't is fixed, so you can move it around. Um, so that way, if, if students who are all signing, or if there's a group of people who are all signing, they can, uh, they can move that furniture around so they can be in a circle, so everyone can see each other instead of being in rows or something like that. Uh, then we get the Ed Roberts campus in Berkeley, and as I mentioned before, Ed Roberts was the first disabled person to graduate from Berkeley, and they actually dedicated an entire campus to him. And in the very center of this building, they have this very large, very beautiful ramp, um, which again is really important not just for, you know, obvious reasons like being being able to um, maneuver through the building if you can't take the stairs, but it's also like this central piece within the building. It's not hidden. You're not being segregated when you take this ramp. This is like the main form of circulation. It's also really cool because in this representation, they're actually using, like you can actually see people with a varying, varying types of disabilities who are represented, whereas usually when you get that, it's like there's maybe just one person in a wheelchair who's kind of like off to the corner, or in some cases, no one in it is, is visibly disabled. Um, and then you also get stuff like this on the campus, where if you go into an elevator, um, they actually have push buttons that are down by your feet. So if you can't use your arms to get to the buttons, you can literally just run or run into these buttons or just kick them, and you can get to whatever floor you want to get to. Then we get uh, the Asclepius machine by uh, my dad, Professor Robert Adams, who teaches here. He's right there. Um, but uh, essentially what this is, is uh, he describes it as a tricked out wheelchair ramp. And 
What's really great about this, again, not only is it a ramp and you know not something like stairs, not only is it accessible, but it creates what I like to call the disabled experience within a space. Um, so as you go through this ramp, uh, the entire thing sort of opens up and expands around you as you move through it. As you pass through the space and as you exit, it slowly moves down and closes behind you. But as it's doing this, it sort of makes this breathing noise that's, sim that's similar to uh, artificial breathing machines that you hear in hospitals. So as soon as you're passing through the space, especially if you're disabled, you're going to recognize this space. It has similar aesthetics to, uh, to hospitals, but it's actually really, really well designed. Um, so you're sort of taking an aesthetic that is usually seen as uh, really ugly, that's not appealing, um, that's something that should be hidden, and completely exploiting that in the best way possible to make this really, really outstanding experience. Um, so now we get into more contemporary times, uh, specifically with uh, the election and uh, inauguration of Donald Trump. So uh, as I'm sure everyone here knows, um, during uh, one of his uh, pr uh, presidential candidate rallies, uh, Trump mocked a disabled reporter. And uh, while that is really, really bad, <laughs> obviously, and is really terrible. It was interesting to me that this was sort of, uh, this was huge to people who weren't disabled. People who weren't disabled were completely blown away by this, whereas a lot of people in the disabled community, they were kind of like, yeah, this is stuff that we experience all the time. And it was interesting that this is what it took to sort of get disabled people into uh not even into the forefront, but just to be a part of any political conversation. Um, it took a candidate mocking one of us. Um, but then it also sort of begs the question, like, there are so many other things that not just Trump, but other politicians have done that hurt disabled people so much more than just being mocked um, that no one really pays attention to. Um, but or they do, but they don't. They don't uh, say this is this is something that's hurting people with disabilities. Um, for example, uh, the uh, the you know the whole repeal and replace Obamacare. If that happens, they're actually voting on it. I think maybe even right now. <laughs> um, but if that were to happen, it's not looking like it's very likely. Twenty four million people are going to lose lose their insurance coverage. And people are going to die because of this. And when you see this kind of stuff covered on the news, you usually, or, you know, town halls that happen, um, you usually get people in the audience who say, uh, for example, um, I'm a single mother. Um, what do I do if I get sick? Or uh, I'm a business owner. And, uh, you know, for example, sort of like a, the flip side to that, under Obamacare, I can't afford... To, uh, to cover all of my employees right now. I can't give them the health care that they deserve. What happens if one of them gets sick? And it's sort of all of these what-if situations that you, know, you hear in the majority of these town halls, in the majority of the, you know, the things that are covered by the news relating to health care. But then no one ever really looks at the disabled community. If I lose my health insurance, this chair is almost $50,000. You're supposed to get a new chair every four years. If I don't have health insurance to cover that, what am I supposed to do? If my chair breaks down, what am I supposed to do? How do I go to school? So there are all of these issues that sort of go beyond the what if, that you know, are very real. And it amazes me that when you know, news channels do things like town halls, like for example, there was one with, uh, it was more of like a, 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 a debate with Bernie Sanders and Ted Cruz, and they sort of had like this face off over healthcare. There was only one disabled person in the audience who asked them a question, and she had polio. There was only one. So the representation with something like healthcare for disabled people is completely lacking. And I do not under, you know, if, if you want to have a conversation about healthcare, you cannot have one without mentioning and without uh, incorporating disabled people and our voices. Um, there's also another thing that's been going on 
with uh, a lot of the tri uh, criticism that Trump has been getting, where people say that um, you know he's he's doing all of these things because uh, because he's mentally ill, not neurodivergent, because he's mentally ill. Um, all of this, uh, you know, all of these really, really terrible negative things that he has done, all of these, uh, you know, racism, what have you, the, everyone's saying he's doing that because he's mentally ill. And there are actually shows that are bringing in psychiatrists to analyze Trump's mental health. And you'll hear on news channels people calling him, you know, saying Trump is crazy, he's insane, he's psychotic, he's having an episode. All of these uh, terms that a lot of people don't know are actually really ableist, really derogatory terms that you should not use, especially if you are not neurodivergent. You should just not use them. You do not describe something, especially something that's negative, as crazy or as insane. Because then that brings on this, that it enforces the stigma that people who are neuro neurodivergent are inherently bad, that they are inherently evil. And what's really important to remember, especially in the case of Trump, is that when you are neurodivergent, the, the sort of like the, the main thing with that is you are experiencing distress. And the difference here is that with Trump, he's not experiencing distress. He is causing other people distress. And yet we are still labeling that as him being mentally ill. We're still calling it that. We're still calling him crazy. He is not crazy. He is not insane. You can call him whatever you want, but do not use terms that are derogatory and that are ableist to describe such evil behavior because that is the type of language that gets people who, not just people who are neurodivergent, but people with all types of disabilities killed. I mean, that's literally what you're enforcing here when you use those types of terms. So you have to be really, really careful with that. Um, then we get, uh, so on March 1st uh, of every year, the disabled community, uh, and hopefully people outside of it, but I don't really know of any, um, celebrate Disability Day of Mourning. And this is a day that we take to celebrate every single disabled person who uh, has been murdered specifically by either um, their relatives or their spouses. And it's, and it's very, very specific to that. And unfortunately, a lot of these people are really young children. Um, so uh, just this year, since January 1st, and I actually have not checked the site in a few weeks, but uh, 14 disabled people have been killed by either their relatives or their spouses alone. This is not including the police. This is not including, you know, strangers. This is not including doctors. This is not including, this is literally just your relatives and your spouses. 14 people. Have you heard about any of this in the news? Has anyone talked to you about this? No one, right? I mean, I didn't even know about this until like just a few weeks before, before uh, Disability Day of Mourning this month, or uh, yeah, this month. Uh, I had no idea. Um, but what's interesting here is that when, um, when I was actually putting this slide together, um, I was trying to find images of some of the victims who had been killed. Um, and I had probably about 30 stories that I was looking at, um, like 30 tabs open, each with a different article that had to do with, with these killings. And out of all of those, only five articles actually had images of the victims. These were the only images that I could get. And I would argue that maybe about half of those articles had images of the actual murderers. And the majority of those images were of them, for example, crying in court. And uh, so not only do you have this lack of uh, representation and therefore lack of remembrance for the people, the actual people who were actually hurt in this, but you have this, um, sort of pity for the people who actually committed these acts, the, the actual murderers here. And not only do you get that with the images, but you get that directly in the text of these articles, where you'll get something like, uh, you know, there was one article that I read that essentially said at the bottom, after it listed everything that had happened, um, 
you know, it essentially reminded the reader to not judge the parent because you, quote, have not walked in their shoes. You don't know what it's like to carry the burden of being a parent to someone who is disabled. So therefore, you should not judge them for decapitating their child. You should not judge them for overdosing their child. You should not judge them for drowning their child. You should not judge them for stabbing their child. You should not judge them for strangling their child, and so on and so forth. And what's really terrible about the majority of these murders is that they are not, um, they are really gruesome murders. They're really, really bad. I mean, if you want to read about some of the like, most gruesome murders that are going on right now, you, you, you just look up. You go to the Disability Day of Mourning website, and you can read all about it. It's amazing. And yet, with the sort of extremity of these murders, there's still sympathy for the people who are committing them, as though they are the victims, as though they are the ones who experienced the real burden here, and not their kids, not their spouses, not the disabled people. And then, Yeko. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Um, so here we have uh, some images of uh, children with disabilities um, who've been wrongly perse persecuted um, or criminalized pu or publicly shamed for their atypical behavior. Um, and African-American students are far more likely to be arrested at school um, than their white counterparts. Um, for example, uh, Celicia Johnson is six and she had a tantrum in school and the police arrested her. Um, Hunter uh, is three, he's on the top right, um, and he's deaf and he's no longer allowed to sign his name because the H in his name makes the sign of a gun, H. And they're not allowed to use that symbol anymore in school. Um, Let's see, Caleb uh, Moon Robinson, 12, bottom uh, left. Um, he's autistic and he was uh, excuse me, convicted of disorderly conduct and felony assault after kicking over a trash can and having an autistic episode. Um, they arrested him and convicted him of a felony charge, as I said. Um, Colton Granito uh, is eight, also autistic. Um, and after an episode at his alternative school, which was expecting him to have one, um, he was actually arrested and placed in a straight jacket and then held in a holding cell at the police station until his parents could pick him up. Um, Michael Kelly, uh, bottom right, has a Down syndrome and plays basketball, um, but the principal of his school, also an alternative school, um, forced him to remove his letter jacket because another parent complained that he's not an, actually, an actual varsity athlete. Um, all these children, uh, and, and many more, are actually uh, victims of a zero-tolerance policy that has gotten more restrictive since the 1990s. Um, it's a, an institutional standard, um, I guess colloquial termed, um, the cult of compliance, um, also found in, in prisons. Um, and David Perry coined the, the term. Uh, David Perry is a freelance journal who actually looks into um, the the disproportionate um, persecution of minorities, um, disabled minorities specifically. Um, and let's see, Mr. Perry uh, also ponders the disproportionate targeting of minorities, especially disabled minorities again, um, by police brutality. Um, Tanisha Anderson was a 37-year-old 30, black woman diagnosed with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia and died while in custody of the uh, Cleveland police. Uh, Keith Scott, Azel Ford, and Jeremy McDole uh, were disabled black men, also among the many police killings in recent years, all were also disabled. Um, an estimated half of the police brutality uh, murders of minorities in the past recent years uh, were due to misunderstood or undiagnosed disability. So what are we doing about this? Um, clearly, there are a lot of problems, um, and uh, you know, like we saw in the 1970s, there are a lot of protests. But with the rise of social media, for the very first time, disabled people now have a platform where you can voice your opinion. I mean, and we we, we mainly do this through Twitter, and of course, Twitter. Uh, isn't going to be something that's accessible for all different types of disabilities. There are still going to be 
uh, you know, some people who can't use it. But right now, this is the most effective platform that we have. Um, so, for example, if you can't go to a protest, um, uh, if you can't, you know, you wake up one day and, for example, maybe you don't have the energy to go out and march down the streets. Or maybe, for example, the streets are not actually accessible and you cannot get to the streets. Um, Twitter is a really, really great way to voice your opinions without having anyone shut you down. You, can, you literally cannot be shut down by using Twitter. Um, and so right now, uh, there's this really, really great sort of sphere of disabled people that are uh, joining the Twitter community to uh, voice their opinions on all sorts of issues. And it's not just voicing your opinions. It's, uh, it's having conversations about certain topics. For example, um, there's a person, their name is Dom Dominic Evans, and they are really interested in uh, film culture and especially with the lack of representation of disabled people with, within film. And so every single week, he hosts this conversation called Film Dis, where anyone who, who's disabled, who has a Twitter, can join this conversation and you essentially talk about film and disability. And uh, it's also really great because um, there are a lot of people out there, myself included, who you have a disability, but you don't really know anyone else who is similar to you. You never really get exposed to that. For example, growing up, I didn't have any friends in school that I knew of who were, who were disabled, let alone who used a wheelchair. Um, so you never really get anyone throughout your life to relate to. And if you can't relate to them, you sort of start to think that a lot of the experiences that you have might sort of be just your own, and you're not really sure if anyone else is experiencing them. And so Twitter is a really, really great platform to hear about other people's experiences and uh, to get in touch with other disabled people, to find people who might even have your same exact disability. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, there have been like some of the most important disability activists right now have you know gotten to where they are because of the platform of of Twitter, and um, I definitely recommend if anyone has a Twitter, I would recommend following some of these people up here because they all are so amazing in these conversations. I mean, I have learned more about disability culture, you know, my my own identity, my own sort of group of people, my own culture, through Twitter and through you know all of these tweets that all of these disabled people are sending out than I have in any other way. I mean, I've literally learned so much from this. So if you wanna be, if you wanna, if you wanna learn about disability activism, disability rights, disability culture, like do that through Twitter because you know, that, that is right now the best and most effective way um, that, that you can do that, that we can get our stories out and that you can, you can participate in. Open, wide, content laden, architecture. To undo that is and our response. What about equity? Equity. Uh, I think of the line, uh, horizontal line. I think of uh, conversation. Balance. Productivity, inclusivity, inclusivity, distant, <laughs> misunderstood, maybe a few more words, jarring, stairs. Our responsibility, <laughs> as in the opposite of. A campus, I think it's excellent. Uh, it's never been better. Lack of understanding. Innovation has obviously proved more problematic because we have some historical buildings. Yeah, I mean, we've got ADA, which has made a huge difference. But I think there really has to be a commitment to making it work. Mm -hmm. I heard of it in school, but never was asked to engage in ADA in school. My first experience was in a firm in Minneapolis. Here's the ADA compliance copies from the manual. Mm -hmm. The formula had been played out play out enough to get it through, mm -hmm. but it wasn't enabling. I mean, to me, with, without ADA, if I were sitting down designing a building, I, I probably would do more than ADA would ask me to. Mm -hmm.
uh, knowing uh, what I know now, but still not knowing enough. But that is so evident of the lack of understanding. I own a business. Uh, I have a historical building. My building's 140 years old. It is accessible from the back, where the main parking is, by the way. How humiliating is that? And for us to renovate the front and make it accessible up, up there would be thirty-five dollars to $40,000. The argument is going to become more and more difficult because it is about money. It's, it's simply not in the cards. If, if that were mandated, we'd have to fold up shop because it, it simply wouldn't work. Um, fully accessible from the back. How humiliating. It's just it's a matter of dollars and cents. You know, I, I don't think it's all that expensive. It, it has defined our society. Mm -hmm. And we're, to undo that is our responsibility. What is the psychological cost of that? What is the psychological cost of Celeste going downtown and uh, the owner of the building says that they can't, they can't give her access to the building because it's an historic section of town. <laughs> I think it's worth asking, you know, why why doesn't the sidewalk system work? And I think in a lot of cities, including Ann Arbor just a few years ago, you know, the sidewalk system was left to the individual property owners to take care of. I mean, if roads are a public service, why are sidewalks not? But that is so evident of the lack of understanding. That's a very narrow way. I think of thinking about architecture and what uh, our responsibility as architects are. Cost has nothing to do with anything. Why would suddenly it be an excuse to not think of inclusivity in design? You can spend how much money on materials that are imported from halfway across the world and you can't make the space inclusive for other people. Or you go to some place and you see, oh, there are the stairs into the restaurant. We'll just go around the back of the alley through all the trash and then smell. And then we'll have, we have a ramp back there for loading produce into the back of the kitchen. How humiliating is that? There is uh, absolutely no excuse for that. It's a question of what, you know, how do you ask the right question? So, where is this? Is, so, that concludes. I think so. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for coming. <laughs> Are there any questions? We have about 10 to 15 minutes for further conversation with Celeste and Miko. Yes. I'd just be curious to know more about the initiative for inclusive design. Like what's your What's your agenda moving forward? I know it's uh, Dilla Das from the provost office was here. Mm -hmm. It's on diversity, equity, and inclusion. I think you're in conversation with that office. Yeah. Um, yeah, we are working with different areas of the diver or of the community, the <laughs> university to help um, kind of further the inclusive spaces that are lacking. Um, they come to us and they just want to know things that they aren't educated in up to this point, um, things that ADA hasn't really covered yet or just doesn't cover at all. Um, and we hold more events. We are participating in the campus-wide uh, competition where we hope to kind of submit how we think the university should be uh, regarding inclusive spaces and accessibility and um, yeah that's where we are currently I think it was an amazing presentation like completely well put together and stunning and super informative to me like it's going to take me a long time to unpack I guess as a designer I look at it as a challenge and I'm curious mm -hmm. to what degree you guys have mobilized on your own challenge not in terms of creating awareness, which I think is super effective, mm -hmm. but like, I don't know, like playing out the game of, um, say, the parking lot or, say, the building that exists already. In terms yeah. Of what potential solutions might be? Because 
Because I hear it as a challenge, and then I'm like, well, how do we address that challenge? And, and so at one level, I think there's the sort of everything all at once all the time, which I think is completely laudable. So we change the parking lot, and then all parking lots are like that, and create a new situation. Mm -hmm. like, what do you do with, like, all the things that exist now? Or how do you, like, is yeah. it that all or nothing in terms of design? Or do you entertain ways of having better solutions in the interim? I mean, I guess I'm curious where this goes from a project of education and awareness to a project of design advocacy as design. Yeah. So that's part of the imagination. Yeah. I mean, the group is heavily involved with research on the campus currently, so we've gone through more of central campus and a little bit of north and just tried to recognize where the inaccessible areas are. We've documented it and we will be presenting it at next Thursday, or next week's conversation. Um, and then just through that, we've kind of open the door to a lot of other areas that are lacking within space. So we're still kind of figuring out all the areas that need to be covered. Um, it's kind of, it, well, I don't want to say impossible. It's just not possible yet to have a completely inclusive space. So for us as architects. Both as a pedagogue, like, because mm -hmm. the request seems to be why not? And so yeah. I think it would be quite interesting as designers in the school, in this group, individuals to like play that out because mm -hmm. I don't know what the answer would be and so at the center in Berkeley which was great and I really loved the reading of the drawing and the entourage but also like typologically it seems like it's a two-story low slung building and so I'm just curious when you confront other more vertical buildings or like what would the world look like would it be one story would it be like you know yeah. or, like fire stairs like i think these are super interesting concerns but mm -hmm. like if it's hard to think about amelioration strategies mm -hmm. I, guess I would like to see the utopian like play it out across the whole field and see what that would be because i think that would be a totally interesting yeah to yeah this, to this sort of i mean i think i think the thing with that is like because um, I'm going to call it uh, non-disabled design is so pre prevalent in in the world, like he, like you mentioned. Um, this isn't something, of course, that we can just fix overnight. And I'm going to argue that it starts with a conversation. So, for example, uh, when I was talking about the ADA Act, not only is that an issue because it comes from the majority being uh, non-disabled people, but it's also kind of a small group of people. So you can't just do something where you're going to say, okay, I'm going to design something that's accessible and I'm going to get one person in a wheelchair and, or maybe like five people in a wheelchair and you know, we're going to be good to go. You can't do that. I can only, tell, I can only talk to you about design coming at you from, a, from the point of view of a wheelchair user. I can't talk about you know, spatial experiences for people who are blind, or people who are deaf or hard of hearing, or people who maybe sometimes can not can walk, but, they, but sometimes they can't and they have to use a chair. So my argument for like the sort of first step in that is gathering as many different voices from as many different types of uh, disabled people as possible. And what's really important with that is so much of, um, you know, our... Our conversations, like the sort of popular conversations regarding disability, disability activism, are totally whitewashed. Disability is like the most intersectional group of people ever. And so when you're bringing disabled voices into the conversation, it can't just be, you know, like white disabled people. It has to be disabled people of all different types of backgrounds. And once you have that group together, then you can start having a conversation about, you know, how do we design this space so not only is it accessible, but it works for all these different types of people and then even more than that. So in IID, what we're trying to do right now is, you know, uh, right now, Mieko, myself, and then another member who couldn't be here today, her name is Emily, we're the only disabled people within the group. And it's really, really hard to do work that we can sort of say is accessible when we're only coming at it from three different points of views. So the work that we're trying to do right now um, is to sort of get as many different types of people uh, from around campus in on our group 
so that we can have the most effective projects. And then once you can do that, then you know what you were saying about how it sort of comes off as like a challenge, which it definitely is, it's always going to be a challenge to do it. But once you have that group of people, then you've got the tools to be able to say, okay, here's how we're going to design something. Um, to add to that, I think a lot of the, the design aspects, the elements, of the role of the architect, or the role of the designer in this, it's not, it's not completely you know, that which is preparing for future design. It's not you know, perspective. It's not um, architecture that has yet to be designed. I think a lot of it does deal with adapting historical sites. Sure. You know, for the library, any, any place, how do, you, how do you deal with such actual ethical uh, questions, issues like that? Um, but I think, I think that part of that part of design, designing social social processes around around accessibility, such as the infrastructure in which, um, like public transportation, for example, we have the architecture there already implemented or in place to allow people to access space accessibly. But yet, the education, say for example, the, the bus drivers who drive that the, those buses, those infrastructure, aren't necessarily educated on how to or taught how to operate that. Than infrastructure, so therefore mm -hmm. it becomes uh, a barrier. And so designing that, designing that education, teaching the bus drivers how to use that. Furthermore, another project we're working on right now is um, is uh, working with. We met just yesterday with um, uh, two women from the University Department of uh, Residential Housing. And so uh, one problem that Celeste encountered last week was the fact that um, during the windstorm, during a uh, two weeks ago, a power outage uh, left Celeste unable to get to her room because she was uh, in one of the accessible rooms, but on the fifth floor of the building. And so, and there was also only one elevator that could take you to the fifth floor, and they had four elevators in the building. And so, the design element, the design challenge in that becomes restructuring where you, where do disabled people live? Which floor? How do you get to there? And making sure that there are alternatives to that when one means of accessibility is, is removed from that equation. Mm -hmm. So it's both yeah, design and you know, um, perspective, but also adaptation. Yeah. yeah. I, I also think as far as pedagogical standards go, I would love to see it as more of a requirement within architect architectural education to kind of implement into the design studios, ADA, and even further beyond that so that it's not just something that we learn once we're in the profession. And it's like, it's kind of looked at, at least in my experience in the professional world, it's like, okay, how do we design around this ADA code or keep our, keep our theme, but still have this ramp off to the side. And I think having it within studio or education would allow for much more creative space to happen early on and kind of just become a habit. <laughs> Yeah, and what's really sort of interesting with that is I sort of think of, you know, accessible design, disabled design, uh, as sort of like the potential computer of the design world. So when we got the computer, that completely changed everything. That was huge. No one had ever really seen anything like it before. And... While I'm sure that was a challenge to invent, look what it ended up doing. It's amazing. So, but there's, there's, it's really unfortunate because there's this whole argument that, you know, we're not going to implement accessible and disabled design and the disabled experience within our architecture and within our spaces because it's just too hard. It's really difficult. And we, as architects, don't want a challenge. We want to do things our way. We don't want to think outside the box with this. And, hmm? and uh, but you know, when you see work like Gallaudet University and the Ed Roberts campus and the Asclepius machine, like those are so beautiful and they work and they're innovative and they make it so that people like me and Mieko and every other disabled person can use them with, you know, with the technology that we have available right now. And that's so amazing. So, you know, when I hear stuff like, oh, I'm not going to design this because it's, it's too difficult. It's like you're, th there is so much potential in terms of what that design can be because you're literally doing something that has never been done before. Or it's been done, but it's not, not really been done. 
And uh, then also kind of going off of what I was saying earlier about how we need to start a conversation, I think not only do we need to start a conversation, but we also need to start promoting disabled designers. Because I think that the majority of not just architects, but really uh, anyone who designs anything, they're, uh, they're either not disabled or their disability is completely ignored. So for example, the other day in my art history class, I was learning about Michael Graves. And you know, towards the end of his life, he had, he had to start using a wheelchair. He designed a bunch of medical equipment that completely rethought you know, what you know, the aesthetic of medical equipment could be. And that was hardly even talked about. Hardly anyone even brought that up. And yet that's huge. That does so much. There's so much untapped potential that he went in and, you know, grabbed onto with that. Um, and so I think, yeah, making sure that we, we start a conversation and that we recognize this as an opportunity rather than, you know, a burden is, is what we need, to, we need to have that sort of change in how we think about design. Anyone else? Okay, thank you.